Well, good morning again, church. Hey, as you're getting your Bible and your bulletin out, if you're watching at home, you don't need to adjust your screen. If you're sitting in this room and you just walked in, Pastor, Tom, Pastor, Pastor Sean did not gain some weight, and he also did not get a sweet tan either, okay? <laughs> I'm Andrew. I'm the lead pastor down on our Chesapeake campus, and I bring great news, season's greetings from Chesapeake. Church, God is doing a great work down at Chesapeake. To think just a little bit over a year ago, back in April of 2021, was when our church was first adopted to be a part of the Coastal family. During that time, April 2021, about 48 people on average were going to this church. Now, just this past month in November, we've been averaging 170 people already going to the campus down there. And not only that, just this past month alone, we baptized three more people. We've been able to serve over 100 Ukrainian refugees that have been displaced by the war that we found that are living right there in that Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Chesapeake area. And not only that, we're able to commission eight deacons. And this past small group season, we saw over 100 people connected to small groups right there at Chesapeake. Look, I, I said it a little bit earlier, church, but there's no greater investment than you can make than to invest in the kingdom of God and to see more churches come up that will help develop authentic followers of Jesus Christ. And we are developing authentic followers of Jesus Christ right there in Chesapeake. And let me just tell you, let me just remind you, what's happening across all of our churches in Coastal is so rare. To think about the increase that God has brought in this season, whether it's at Gloucester, Hampton, right here at Yorktown, Williamsburg coming soon, or right in Chesapeake. Man, we rejoice for what the Lord is doing. And to see what he's doing, it brings me great joy. As a pastor, I rejoice in that. But today, let me ask you, what is it that brings you great joy? Are you experiencing joy today? On December 11th, 2022, what is it that brings you joy? You know, we just heard how the angel went to announce the birth of Jesus. And when the angel announced the birth of Jesus, Luke records in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, where the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Good news of great joy for all the people. Well, it's officially the Christmas season. Mariah Carey has been defrosted. <laughs> and all I want for Christmas is playing on the airways and all of the streaming channels. And you're going to hear certain phrases repeated this time of year. You're going to see them plastered in stores, on coffee mugs, um, on websites, in people's yards. You're going to see phrases like peace, hope, and joy. But again, I want to ask you, what brings you joy? Is it even possible in 2022, in our culture right now, to experience joy? Luke records a testimony of the angels, and he says the coming of Christ, his first advent, it didn't even just bring regular joy. He says that this good news brought great joy. In fact, today, if you look at your bulletin, we're going to be in John chapter 15, and Jesus even said, look, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. But I wonder how many of you right now, whether it's been for days, weeks, or months, wouldn't even say that you're having great joy right now. In fact, what you're experiencing, you wouldn't even say is remotely full. I wonder how many of you right now, if we could actually peek into the curtain of your heart, what was happening in your life, in your home, that you would even say what you've been experiencing is the opposite of joy. In 2010, the Intercontinental Medical Statistics Corporation released a report that in the US, 253 million prescriptions were written for antidepressants. Church, 253 million back in 2010. 
Man, if that by some chance is a one-to-one -one ratio, that is over 75% of the population of the United States at that time. The same report said in 2010 that Americans spent about $11 billion on prescription antidepressant medication. Now, Coastal isn't the type of church where we downplay how important it is for you to get connected with a good counselor. In fact, it's even the reason why we hired a full-time biblical counselor on staff right here at our church to serve members. We're not even the type of church that say that medication is not helpful for a season to help you with your mental health. But church, we cannot forget that mental health, how we feel, our emotional health is also spiritual health. Part of you being and getting healthy mentally, emotionally, is rooted in what you're thinking spiritually. The type of joy that is available to you to this day, on this day, in this season, it isn't some type of Ned Flanders type of joy. It isn't even the type of joy that maybe a televangelist offers on TV, but it's a type of joy that is opposite of what the world offers. It's the type of joy that the coming of Jesus would bring that would bring great joy for anyone who would believe in him. In fact, the writer of the Christmas song, O Holy Night, wrote that in that song, the coming of Jesus helps a weary world rejoice. And the fact that there is this second coming of Christ that is coming again, it brings the type of joy that he wants to give you to the full. So even if what you've been feeling for the past few weeks or months or even years is the opposite of joy, you can take a step today. You can take a step today to live a life that is marked by joy. You can live a life that is marked by great joy that is for you. But there are some conditions. I'm going to read John chapter 15, starting in verse 9 today. I'm going to read the whole passage. I'm going to take some time and pray and then I want to share with you three steps that you can take today to begin to experience this joy to the full that Jesus talks about in this passage. John chapter 15, starting in verse 9. Jesus is speaking, and he says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things, Jesus said, I command you so that you will love one another. Let's pray together. Father God, your word is so good. Lord, it's so good, even just on its own and just reading this out loud, God, I pray that we would be a church that would abide. The joy that you give, the joy that's available, God, it's not the way that the world gives it. It's not even remotely close, Lord, to what the world offers. I pray, God, that that would be the joy that we would seek. I pray, Lord, that this joy that you're talking about to the full would mark our lives. Lord, it would change our lives. Again, Lord, no matter what we've been feeling, whether it's been for weeks or months or years, help us, Lord, not to believe the lie that joy is not available to us. Because Jesus coming, it brings great joy. 
Jesus coming even can bring joy to the full. So would you fill us today in Jesus' name? Amen. Church, you can take a step to have joy to the full right now, even in this Christmas season, if, number one, write this down, if you abide in Christ and keep his commands. If you abide in Jesus and you keep his commands. Look back again at verse 9 in chapter 15. Look back, we're going to unpack this because this is so key. It is so important. Jesus said in verse 9, he says, look, as a father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus says, look, as the Father loved me, so have I loved you. The Father loves the Son perfectly. The Son loves the Father perfectly. This is a picture of this close fellowship, this close relationship between God the Father and God the Son. It's the type of love that is pictured as centered to the Trinity. Jesus says this is the same type of love that he wants to show to his follow followers. His disciples that he was talking to 2,000 years ago and his followers that he's talking to today. This is the type of love that the Father would show to Christ. This type of love is the greatest type of love. And it's the same type of love that Jesus wants to show us today. In fact, church, would you help me just remind the people of this incredible truth today. Would you turn to the person sitting next to you? Would you look him in the eye? And would you tell them, hey, Jesus loves you. Now turn to the person who was your second choice and tell him, hey, by the way, you too. <laughs> Can I just remind you of something today? God loves you. He really does. No matter your past, or your sin, or your shame, no matter your circumstance right now, God loves you. But it's not the type of love that you have for ice cream or the Seattle Seahawks, okay? <laughs> the love that he has is unconditional. It's a type of love that he would even point to just a little bit later in this passage where he said he loved his disciples so much that he was going to lay down his life for his friends. Man, it's a type of love that is pictured at the center of the gospel that the apostle Paul will talk about in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 where he says, God demonstrates, God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's the type of love that is pictured that this Jesus who is God came here to this earth to die on the cross and pay the price for our sins. These sins that would separate us from God, that would lead us to an eternity apart from God. But Jesus who is God came here and died on the cross providing a way for us. But the good news is three days later, he bodily rose from the grave, conquering sin, conquering death, conquering the grave. So if we repent of that sin, we believe this good news, and we will receive this joy that Jesus wants to bring into our lives. This is the type of love that should cause a response in us. He says, look, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. And because of that great love, look again what he says in verse 9. He says, abide in my love. That word abide there really just means to remain, to stay, to reside in. Church, abiding in the love of Christ means to remain in and stay in and reside in, to rest in the fact that you really are truly, deeply, and unconditionally loved by Christ. And there was any other question, look, Jesus actually tells his disciples a little bit further how to abide. He says, look, abiding looks like this in verse 10. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. Abiding looks like keeping your focus on the love of Christ, but also it's obeying Christ. It's kind of like what Jude, who was Jesus' half-brother, would say when he was writing to his recipients 
that this is the love that they need to contend for and that they need to remain in. In Jude 21, Jude says, look, keep yourselves, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. God's love for you is unconditional. Therefore, we are to abide in his love, to rest in it, to stay in it, to remain in it. And we do that by doing the things that he's called us to do, the things that he has commanded us to do. Church, abiding is obedience. And then look at the result in John chapter 15, verse 11. He says, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. But did you see the conditional part? God's love for you, unconditional. Abiding and experiencing this joy that he wants to give you, conditional. In verse 10, he says, if, if, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Did you notice that little word right there, if? You know, last week, Pastor Sean taught on Philippians chapter four, where the apostle Paul said, look, you need to be thinking about these things. You need to be putting these things into practice, which is a reminder that when it comes to obeying Christ and following him and abiding him, it's things that we need to put into practice as we choose to obey him. Look, this is not in your notes, but I want you to write this down. I want you to write down practice makes perfect, okay? Everyone write that down. Practice makes perfect. Even if you weren't taking notes before, I want you to write that down. And once you have it written down, I want you to wave at me, okay? Wave at me if you have it written down. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. All right, good. Now scratch it out. (laughs) Write this down instead. Practice makes progress. It's as we obey Christ, as we trust in him, this is how God sanctifies us. This is how he grows us. It's when we choose to obey him when everything in life is good, when everything in life is all sunshine and butterflies and no traffic on 64. (laughs) But see, it's also when we choose to obey him when we put these things into practice, when life is hard, when life is heavy laden, when there are so many burdens it feels like we're carrying, when we are experiencing the brokenness in the world, not only just around us, but in our very lives. It's when we still choose to obey him that he sanctifies us and he continues to make us new. This is where he brings in this joy. Now, this isn't some sort of fleeting happiness where it's only based on our feelings. In fact, right now in our world, in our culture, the world and the culture pretty much says, no matter what, do whatever feels right to you because that will be what makes you happy. Do whatever feels good. That is what brings you joy. So if looking at pornography makes you feel good, Go ahead and do it, because that will be what brings you joy. If reassigning your gender, what God gave you, that he ordained for you, makes you feel good, go ahead and do it. If overeating and indulging during the Christmas season, because it makes you feel good, even though there's a pain you're trying to hide or a sin you're not trying to deal with, Because it makes you feel good, go ahead and do it. The world says whatever feels good, go ahead and do it. Church, following our emotions and feelings like that are only leading to more brokenness in us and around us. Church, our emotions are God-given. In fact, they can be very great companions. Our emotions can even help reflect the heart of Christ and the heart of God. And our emotions, yes, they can be a blessing from the Lord, but they make a terrible leader and a horrible Lord. Worldly happiness is not biblical joy. 
But the type of joy that Jesus is talking about here in this passage, look, this isn't based on looking further inside of ourselves, but it's based on looking at Christ. In fact, the word full there, it actually even means to to bring to completion. This joy that Jesus wants to give you, this is a joy that will help you be completed in this life. In fact, the word joy there in the original language is the word kara, and it simply means to be glad, a state of rejoicing, and a state of happiness. Man, doctor, pastor, theologian, Tony Evans, he says it this way. He says, joy is internal stability in spite of our external circumstances because of the knowing that God is in control. It's settled assurance and quiet confidence in God's sovereignty. Church, abiding in the Lord brings joy if you keep his commands. You can have joy to the full if you abide, if you remain in, if you stay in the love of God and keep his commands. But then Jesus gives two more very practical ways that you can abide, that you can experience this joy that completes you, that he wants to give to you no matter what's happening around you. Write this down, number two, okay? You can experience this joy to the full if you love your community and keep his commands. If you love your community and you keep his commands. Look again what Jesus says in verse 12. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Here we know that Jesus is challenging his disciples to love one another. In fact, we are commanded as his followers to love one one another. Have you ever thought about why in the world Jesus had to command his disciples to love one another? It's because loving people isn't primarily a matter of feeling. It's a matter of will. It's a matter of letting the Lord lead you. And Yorktown, can I be honest with you today? Sometimes I don't like people. Sometimes people are very hard to love. Sometimes it's not even just everyone out there. Sometimes it's even my own children in my household. (laughs) In fact, I have four kids, and and maybe some of you guys have wondered what it's like to have four kids. Just imagine you already have some kids, and someone hands you a baby as you're drowning. That's what it's like (laughs) to have four children. I see Jesus knew it would be hard to love people or minimum challenging. So he had to command us to do it so that we would make the choice to do it. In fact, have you ever thought about the very disciples that Jesus is talking to right here in John chapter 15? Look, Judas is already gone, okay? Forget about him. We're not not talking about him in this passage. Right here around this circle of people that he's talking to, there was a tax collector, Matthew, who was one of Jesus' followers, was a tax collector. And tax collectors in the first century, let's just say they were very pro-government. In fact, they would cozy up to the government because they benefited from what the government would offer them. Man, there were some fishermen and businessmen in this group of disciples, like Peter and Andrew and James and John. There were these zealots who were in his disciple group right here, and zealots were the opposite of pro-government. In fact, they were saying this thing is corrupt. It is messed up. We need to reset the whole thing. There were some doubters in this group, like Thomas, who even back in John chapter 14 would say, God, I have no idea what you're doing, Jesus. I don't know what you're doing. And later on, we would say after Jesus rose from the dead, I won't believe it until I can see him and literally put my fingers in his wounds. There were some that worshiped him from the moment they realized who he was. There were people in this disciple group who hated Samaritans and who hated Gentiles. In fact, his followers would later include Samaritans and Gentiles and Ethiopians and Greeks and people from every ethnic background. 
In fact, could you imagine this group of people sitting at your Christmas dinner table this year? What would the conversation be like? And I started to think why he had to command us this. Because sometimes it seems right now in our culture, the greatest amount of hatred toward Christians actually comes from other Christians. And church, if the greatest amount of hatred for other believers in Jesus comes from us, we've missed it. Jesus says, look at this group of people. He says, look at this group of people and love this community. Love one another. This is keeping his command. This is abiding. In fact, later on in John chapter 17, he would even pray that they will be one, like he and the Father are one. And by this, the world would even know. This this messed up, jacked up group of people of every single socioeconomic status, ethnic status, every group of people coming together under the gospel. He said, by this, the world would know that you are my followers. Church, again, the world says, look inside yourself. Follow your feelings. Do whatever it is makes you happy. Focus on you because that's what makes you happy. But God says, abide in Christ. You want to experience joy. You abide in the Lord and you love the people around you, even the difficult ones. Because this is the type of love this is the type of abiding, abiding that brings you joy. And then last one I want to challenge you to take a step on today. Number three, write this down. You can experience joy to the full in this Christmas season if you remember you've been chosen, you produce some crops, and you keep his commands. You remember you've been chosen, you keep, you produce some crops, and you keep his commands. Look again at verse 16. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Pause right there for a moment, okay? You know, it's it's interesting to know that Jesus said, you did not choose me, I chose you. In the first century, if you wanted to follow a rabbi or teacher or philosopher, you would choose that rabbi teacher or philosopher. You'd be the one that goes to say, I want to follow that particular system, teaching, philosophy. So you will go to that rabbi, teacher, or philosopher, and you would choose them. Not only that, like in response, the rabbi would typically choose some of the most elite, the, the people who had the greatest status or greatest wealth or were considered already very wise and smart. They would typically choose in response to the, the student choosing them, the most elite students. And Jesus does the opposite here. In fact, he said, you did not choose me. I chose you, which is just a reminder. Look, you have been elected by God. It's a reminder that we have not been chosen based on our own merit. We have not been chosen based on anything that we've been done, but only by God and his sovereignty choosing us. And if if that was all that he did, to choose us and to adopt us into his family, if that was all he did, that would be good enough. But he didn't stop there. He says, look, I've chosen you, but I've also appointed you. Church, you've been elected and you've been appointed. You've been given this job to make the family of God bigger. That is through sharing the gospel and building the kingdom. Man, the fruit that Jesus is talking about here It's simply asking the question, are you making disciples? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you growing and helping others grow in Christ and abide in Christ? Are you praying for those who are far from God and for other brothers and sisters who are suffering or even being persecuted? He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, he may give it to you. Church, how your prayers are even answered are connected to how you're abiding and the fruit that you're producing. You've been chosen, so produce some crops and keep his commands. 
I thought I would close out this sermon today by simply asking you some agricultural, some gardening questions, and just keeping with the theme that Jesus has here and abiding in him and how this is to produce much fruit. So I thought I would ask you three questions to see what your crops look like in this season. So the first question is, what do you need to water? What do you need to water right now in this season? For some of you right now, what you need to water to abide in Christ, to experience his joy and his love is a relationship. For some of you, that may even mean that right now, what you need to water is your marriage relationship this Christmas season. Look, husbands, you have been called, you have been commanded to love your wife in the same way that Jesus loves the church. As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so I love you. He even said that he was going to lay down his life for his friends. So husbands, are you loving your wife in a way today that you are willing to even lay down your life for her? For some of you, kids in the room, young kids, teenagers, you have been commanded to obey your parents. I thought for sure I would get a clap right there, an amen, like <laughs> thumbs up. Like I thought parents were going to back me up on that. Kids in the room, you've been commanded, you've been called to obey your parents. Thank you. Sometimes I think that we forget that this command to love one another means the people who are even closest to us. The people who are in our household, our husbands, our wives, our literal brothers and sisters, our parents. Are you loving one another? It's what you need to water right now, a relationship to abide in Christ, to obey what he's called you to do. But not only that question, okay, the second question, what is it you need to dig up right now or cut out? What do you need to dig up right now as to allow the Lord to convict you of something that's happening in your life? What is it that maybe he's even been pointing out in this season that you need to allow him to dig up in your life and to cut out of your life? Is this a season where you've had a secret sin that's keeping you from abiding? Are you choosing to live in sin? And are you lying right now, sneaking around, sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend, having some sort of secret addiction that you haven't confessed to anyone? What is it right now that you need to dig up and have the Lord even cut out of your life? For some of you right now, what, what I believe that maybe you need to have cut out or even dug up out of your life is the news. Church, toxic information is a joy killer. More now than ever, look, the enemy wants to exhaust your emotions, your thinking with all of this information and disinformation that's mostly thought toxic. And again, can I, maybe it's just confession Sunday for me today, but one of the things that I struggle with all the time that I am a news junkie. I have all these news apps on my phone and I'm doing the continual scrolling that they've built into these news apps now. I listen to podcasts that are based on the news to see what it is that's happening in the world and happening in Washington or government. I listen to a lot of news. But I have found when I'm abiding in the news, when I'm abiding in what's happening in Washington, all that does is fill my heart and my life with sadness, anxiety, and fear. Sometimes it even causes me to forget the sovereignty of God, to think he's still not in control. Church, don't believe the lie. The Lord has not lost control. Don't abide in D.C. Abide in Jesus Christ. What is it that God needs to cut out of your life right now? And last question, what do you need to plant again? What is it that you need to allow the Lord to plant or to do again in your life? You know, it's so interesting to note that John is writing this after the resurrection. He's writing this after Jesus rose from the dead and even ascended to heaven. In fact, most Bible scholars and historians believe that the, the gospel of John was probably written somewhere around 80 to 90 AD, about 50 years after Jesus rose from the dead. 
And as I was reading this and preparing for this message, I started to think, I wonder how many times in that 50 years, after John had experienced all these things with Jesus, saw him raised from the dead, ascend to heaven, and then to go through all these struggles in life, how many times did John hear the words of Jesus repeated in his head, abide, 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 obey, 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 love one another, love one another. How many times, church, do we have to hear the same things over and over and over again before it settles in our mind and the truth settles in our heart? But see, the good news is practice makes progress. So there might be something right now that maybe you've taken out of practice that God wants you to put it back into your life. Maybe it's what Pastor Sean talked about last week and simply rejoicing in the Lord always and making the choice to rejoice. No matter your circumstance, no matter what's happening around you, it's easy to believe the lie that God has abandoned you. There is no joy available. But the truth is, he has not left you. He will not abandon you. Whatever it is you're going through, he's going to see you through. So maybe right now what you need to plant again is just making the choice, despite your circumstance, to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, make the choice to rejoice. Maybe you need to worship again, even in the pain, even in the sorrow. Maybe one of the things you need to do is to, is to actually open up your mouth during the worship service, even if you don't like these songs, but to sing them out loud to bring glory to God, to abide in him. There's something about when you connect your heart to worship that God brings in his joy as you abide Maybe you need to plant again, simply picking up your Bible, making it a habit again to abide in his word. Maybe you need to repent of your sin again. Again, maybe you believe the lie that even though it's a hundredth time that God's not gonna forgive you. But the truth is, his word says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a verse that you can put on repeat. Do you need to confess your sin and repent again. Maybe you need to surrender again. Maybe you need to get counseling again. You tried it before, but would you try it again? Maybe you need to join a group again. Maybe you need to actually commit to and join this church. Maybe you simply need to open your heart to love again. Or maybe you're sitting in this room and it's time to return to Jesus again. You've wandered far, and you even know why you decide to tune in online today, to sit in this room today. But he's calling you to abide. Would you obey? Would you go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes? And I just want to speak to the person who's sitting in this room today. And maybe as, if, you, if you've already trusted Jesus, if he's already the Lord and leader of your life, but maybe right now as we've been doing some crop examination, <laughs> Maybe there's something right now that you need to water in your life. Maybe there's something right now that you need to allow the Lord to dig up in your life. Or maybe there's something right now that you need to plant again. And if that's you today, if like you've done some crop examination, there's a step that you believe God wants you to take. You need to plant something again. You need to water something again. You need to have him dig out something in your life. Would you just raise your hand up so I can pray for you? Raise it up. Raise it up and just keep it up for a moment so I can pray for you. Raise it up. And I want you to know all of you who have your hands up, you, look, you are not alone in what it is you're going through. The Lord has not abandoned you, but he wants you to abide. So would you take a step to obey what he's called you to do, to abide in his love, and to trust him again? And I want to speak to the person who maybe right now hasn't yet trusted Jesus as the Lord and leader of your life. Maybe you know that you've been trying to fill your life with all these other things to bring you joy, but it's only leading to more brokenness. Look, the first step to abiding is realizing that he's been calling you, that he chose you, that he loves you. And that same grace that Jesus is talking about is available for you right now. 
So would you surrender your life to him? And that's you today. You want to trust Jesus to be the Lord and leader of your life. I want you to pray this simple prayer right where you are. Again, these aren't some sort of magical words, but it's just connecting the fact that he chose you, he loves you. He wants you to be in relationship with him. Right where you are, when you say, Jesus, I want to abide. I repent of my sin. I believe the good news that you are God. You died on the cross for my sin. and You bodily rose from the dead. Jesus, fill me with your joy. And that's you today. You pray to ask the Lord and leader of your life. While everyone says their heads down, their eyes closed, you just raise your hand up, slip it up and slip it back down so I can pray for you, okay? All right, anyone else? Father God, I just want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness in this season. And again, Lord, sometimes it seems like the world is out of control. But you, Lord, have not lost control. Lord, you call us as a church to abide in you. So I pray, Lord, no matter our circumstance this Christmas season, no matter what's happening around us, God, would you remind us of your truth? Would you remind us of what you've commanded us and even called us to do? Lord, help us to love one another, even when it's hard. Lord, help us to not make it a matter of feeling, but a matter of will. Lord, your will, what you've called us to do. We love you, God, and we praise you. Fill us with that joy that completes us. In Jesus' name, amen.